There you go. Thank you. All right. Cool. It actually is the benefit of having an AV guy. It actually, like, the audio just works. Um, so what's up? My name is Ryan Walsh. I, um, I wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, I really appreciate you guys all coming out to hear me speak. Um, a lot of the ideas um, that are I'm going to talk through tonight are the first time that I've actually presented them in front of anyone. So it'll be pretty good. But I'm just uh, giving you a quick please to say, hey, bear with me. And also, I really would like you guys to grill the shit out of me in Q&A or afterwards or on Twitter or whenever, because I really like to put ideas and thinking through the rigor. So I don't expect it to be perfect, but I do think that um, I will get some great questions out of you, which would be really awesome. So um, a little story about me. So last year I was working at Apple and I decided I didn't want to work there anymore. So I, when I don't know what, I, what to do next, because I was working in music, and it's like, okay, well, if you're going to work in music, like, what other company are you going to work at besides Apple? Spotify? I don't change teams, so I decided that I wasn't going to do that. So I, um, when we were finishing up the design of the, um, the music service that just launched, the new version of, of, um, of Apple Music, I... Um, I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. So every time in my career when I don't know what to do, I go out and I do free work. So free work meant every Friday right around noon without the permission of any senior management at Apple um, or any of my employees, they, I basically left and went and worked at a startup of various different sizes for free for a few hours. I mean, this was could have been, where did I work? I mean, I don't want to name names, uh, but the there is... <laughs> For a funny reason, I can tell you afterwards over a beer. But the um, uh, I can uh, I basically can say like I spent a, a bunch of time with all different types of companies. They were uh, unicorn startups, public companies, um, really really early stage stuff. And the consistent thing I found notice I didn't join any of them because the consistent thing I found was that everybody was focused on mechanics. It was like everybody who talked to me about either a role or was talking to me about a problem, they didn't say, I want to build something different. I want to build something that's better. That's the thing that I already have. I want to make it uh, more optimized for growth. I want it to be faster. I want it to be a different color. I want to do A-B testing. I want to do some type of experiment. I want to basically iterate on the thing that I already have, which is fine. But I was really tired after working with all of these folks. I was like, God, this is just not very inspiring. And so I, I was thinking more about, like, why is this not inspiring me? This is my job. This is the thing that I really love to do. And I realized at the same time that the Lean Startup is about 10 years old. The Lean Startup gave us a lot of great stuff. I mean, not just the book by Eric Ries, but the whole start Lean Startup methodology, the Steve Blank stuff, the whole school of thought. It gave us some really, really interesting stuff. And what it gave us is a democratization of founding startups. So you can, with a credit card, a little bit of code, and, um, and an idea, launch a startup on AWS. Like, that didn't happen in 2005 or 2006. But the other thing that it gave us also was this incredible hyper-rationality and a focus on being better versus being different. So you start off with an idea, it's an MVP, and then you consistently continue to make it better. Sometimes in a linear narrative sort of way, but oftentimes it's just like, okay, can we get this 1% better, or half a percent better, or a little bit faster? Um, but I just thought to myself, like, how many times have you found something that's like really, really awesome that you love and you use every day that was like, man, they iterated the shit out of this. <laughs> it's incredible. I can't, I'm so glad that they iterated it. Not to say that it's a bad strategy, but it's like oftentimes not, not, at least in my soul, it's not correlated. Maybe scientifically correlated, but in my soul, it's not correlated with like really great things. So I kept, so I thought to myself like, all right, well, what is the, like, what is the path to different? Like, how can we, how could you take the art of like making different things or like, or even like Steve Jobsian like products, right? How do you take that art and make it into a science that people can actually do? So that you take the myth out of the legendary found product people or design folks and you take it and you make it something that other people can understand, that they can think through. So I thought the first thing I wanted to do was find a counter metaphor to the hyper rationality that was in. Uh, that was in product design as I was seeing it. And so the first place I looked was StoryCraft. Now, I'm a storyteller by choice, not by talent. 
And the, 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 the thing that I've learned a lot about do, telling stories over time, and it's, it's mostly because I just don't know how to shut up that I became good at telling stories, but the, the thing that's interesting is that um, like stories have like, uh, they're like a natural thing that designers and product folks understand because that you know the whole design thinking idea of being empathetic and trying to take people through almost like a linear narrative is kind of inherent. I mean, there's things called funnels and and whatnot in product design, right? So like people are thinking in terms of these like sort of narrative constructs. But there was a study that was done last year, or maybe it was a couple years ago. I read about it last year, and they said that um, it introduced this concept of neural coupling. And what that means is that when someone is telling a story and someone is listening to a story, if they, if they are interested in the story, if they have some sort of relatability and it's a good story, and I'll, I mean, I could spend an hour talking about that, what's good and what's relatable, but essentially if they're on the same page and it's a good story, the brain signals, quote unquote, I'll just use the unscientific term signals, the brain signals are basically the map of the brain, it basically is firing in almost the exact same way. Like, there, there, is an, there is an empathetic, like, dopamine, serotonin, all different sections of the brain and the different chemicals of the brain are all kind of firing in the same way because they're sharing an experience, one in the imagination of the listener and one in the imagination of the teller. Now, they're both two completely different images, but they're shared. I thought, wow, that is really, really similar to what we try to do when we make empathetic decisions and empathetic analyses in product design. So I went back to this book that I read when I was a kid because I thought I would be a writer. I didn't, didn't work out. But the, the thing that's interesting about this book, well, a couple of things interesting about this book. One, John Gardner is like a, like a pipe smoking, big haired, like lamb chop 70s haircut dude who like has this writing style that's kind of like F you, but kind of like I'm really smart, but he actually is smart so he can get away with it. It's a very entertaining read just for the way that he constructs it. But the, the, some of the things he was talking about really, really apply to when, you know, trying to design an experience for people. Technology aside, product development processes aside, typical design methodologies aside, just like thinking, I want to take someone through an experience. And the key metaphor that he uses is that in fiction, authors who are excellent at their craft create shared vivid dreams with their audience. And I was like, holy crap, this is something that's really, really interesting. So what's a, what's like, what are the constructs of a dream? Like, let's think it through a little bit. So the first thing is that dreams don't have any rules. I like that. Okay, so that means that basically anything's on the table when you're trying to create something, a shared experience between uh, like a, a creator and an audience. Second thing is that they sort of melt convention. Like, the, you know, when you have a dream, it's not like, like, you know, gravity usually holds up in your dreams, but, you know, there's not really a, you know, there's not really much more convention than that. Like, you could, you could be walking upside down on the wall. You could be in some random place you've never been. You could be anywhere. It's kind of like, it's, there's really no convention, really. And the interesting the thing that is about dreams is that the, that convention is eschewed, but oftentimes all things from your subconscious, your rational conscience, your um, your day-to-day -day life, all come in and are sort of reforged in this way that is, you know, not of your control unless you're a uh, like a con like dream lucid dreamer that can control it. And if you are, let's talk afterwards. But because you probably have way cooler stories than me. Um, but the the um, the the idea being that you. You essentially just reforge all these different parts of your psyche into something that's new that ends up being like a radically emotional experience. Every dream that you remember for the time that you remember it, I would say it's pretty emotional. Whether it's calming or exciting or stressful or the concept of an anxiety dream, which I have all the time. Like there is uh, a ton of different emotions associated with dreams, but they're all usually pretty intense. At least that's my experience. So, okay. So, from this subconscious, from all these experiences, from this deep emotional experience, like dreams don't really, you don't iterate on dreams. Like you don't sit, they're like one day when you wake up, it's not like, oh wow, I'm very surprised that the last element in the story for this dream today was that the button was blue this time instead of red. Like what a much more enjoyable dream I had. Like, so I thought, okay, well maybe this construct is, is useful for trying to put some, you know, some science into the artwork of designing a new and different experience. So could the idea of emergence, could the idea that, that basically 
creating this fictional dream world, or this, or even not fictional, this dream world that is a shared, very deeply shared emotional experience between, between audience and author, could that be the goal of a, um, a series of exercises or analyses that were not quantitative, but qualitative and emotional, that would then lead to creating something different, not better? So, I'm going to give you a few examples today of what I think are ways that products can be emergent rather than iterative. Some of these things you could argue is iterative. Some of them you probably could argue as being um, you know, some other characteristic. And I'm not really interested in saying, like, everyone is wrong about the lean startup or everyone is wrong about da 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 What I'm interested in doing is just saying all those other frameworks are awesome. Like, you know... Christianity and Judaism is awesome, but I'm going to go Buddhist for a little while, so just bear with me. So, emergent products, what do they do? Like, what is like, what if I was going to say, like, describe an emergent product in a general way? Well, first thing is that they define rules. So, iterative things play on the, previ on the rules of the previous thing they iterated off of. Emergent things create new sets of rules. Best example of this is the iPhone App Store. So, iPhone launches, there's apps. I can tell you for a fact from folklore at Apple that Jobs did not know to launch the App Store when the iPhone came out. And then he saw it, it was like, shit, I should launch an App Store. And then they built the App Store. Like, and so the, 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 the emergence was not like a super wow moment. It was basically like, oh, I see the signal. I realize it's coming. I didn't plan on this being there. But the App Store wasn't just something to, um, wasn't just something for Apple to take as a next step. It was like, oh, the reason why we're taking this step is because we're going to unlock an entire economy, not for Apple, but for the world. And that's why they did it. So when you redefine rules or you create new sets of rules, the other thing that you do is you end up shifting point of view. And like shifting point of view, especially for people that are doing product design, like that's a really dangerous thing to try to do. Because how hard is it to, to change a habit? Isn't Nir Eyal have an entire career and fortune based on trying to tell people how to change their habits? Like, I'm pretty sure, like, he's the guy, right? It's like $4,000 to talk to him in a seminar. But the, the, what, I, what I think, though, is that the guy's mostly right, though. Like, that it's really hard. There's a whole bunch of psychology around it. you got to do it that way. But what if you took it one step further and you didn't, try to, um, you didn't try to just build a habit? What if you had to rethink the entire world around shifting a, a point of view? Now, that doesn't mean throwing out everything that's, that's previous and going for, um, like, just putting something new. It's not like, you know what, long scrolling feeds of content don't work anymore, so guess what it is now? Text. Like, that doesn't mean anything. It's just like changing something just to change it. There's got to be some sort of way that you want to shift the point of view that's intentional. So it's like, all right, well, what's intentional? I think that what's intentional is rotating on an axis of trust. So rather than linearly progressing, like think of the analogy of the trust that you have with your user base or with the people that you're designing this thing for, because I hate calling people users, I like calling them audiences, because I mean, as much as the VC world is trying to train me out of it, I'm still a media guy at heart. Um, and so the, like, so basically the pole in the middle of the room is the trust that you have with the user. You need to define what that is, really clearly understand what the characteristics of that trust pole is essentially, and then rotate around it. And then see how far you can go to change the point of view to make a new experience. Maybe a little bit of a weird metaphor, but I think you'll get it in a minute. So I'm gonna look at three different ways that you can, that I, I basically think that products have emerged on this concept of like sort of rotating on, um, rotating on an axis of user trust. And I think that you'll be pretty familiar with them, and hopefully this will put some, um, it'll congeal a little some of these like sort of more esoteric ideas into something that's more meaningful. So first is Snapchat. So Snapchat is basically like the most prevalent content type emergent product on the planet. It is amazing what they have done. They started off in uh, about four years ago as Pictaboo. Um, which is essentially, you know, just communication that was, you know what it all what it, you all know what it was. If you don't know what Snapchat is, see me after. I've got homework for you. Um, 
But anyway, so it's, yeah, so the pictures are disappearing, right? So the whole user trust angle was that like, okay, if I send you this photo, it's going to disappear, but you will get a chance to see it. And, you know, is it that pixelated? I was actually really worried about this like pixelated image I was about to show here because I'm so freaked out about showing designers pixelated images on the screen. <laughs> this is 100% like Apple whipping. Like if I had done that like in a meeting at Apple, they'd be like, Ryan, I have to have a conversation. Um, <laughs> And so, um, and so anyway, so yeah, so this is the interface. Looks pretty awesome. Four years ago, this is what your interface was. How about that? Still skeuomorphic. And, send, and so basically, you just send it to your friends. OK, whatever. So that's, I mean, so that's how it started. They got a bunch of users. It was really great. A year later, they decide to add video as a content. OK, interesting. Seems pretty logical. However, by adding video to there, it began to take on more of a storytelling aspect it like it it took the it took the audience one step closer to um to the their ultimate goal and the, and that step was just will people share videos the way they will share photos and lo and behold they continued to grow and the trust in this app continued to grow also notice this was also the same time in which they um enabled real friend names about a year later they created the story now the story is now a very long type. So now we're, we've gone from, in two years, we've gone from I'm sharing photos to each other to now I'm sharing a linear narrative that I'm creating over the course of a day. They didn't say that it was supposed to be over the course of a day. That came about over the first three months of the application being out. And they basically, like the, the public basically said, or the audience basically said, okay, 24 hours is about right. Why is 24 hours right? Because it left for 24 hours on other people's devices. A day to make, a day to watch. Next up, the story replay. Wait a minute, there was that ephemerality. Now it's back. And they actually tried to charge for it. But, the, um, but anyway, but there was. It was a step in the direction, not a major product move, but a step in the direction of removing ephemerality, which was another indication of like people are trusting us to now create entire stories about themselves. We can start to move away from the, addition, the original trust that we have with the audience and move around it so they can start to create new things and engage with us more. Next up was chat. Now, it seems like, oh, this is just like a typical bolt-on feature you need to have in a social network, right? Well, I think the reason why this happened is because, um, is because the audience and the receiver were far away. And so, okay, so now they're basically sending videos to each other, creating stories. It was a very popular feature right off the bat. But the distance between you and your audience was pretty far. There was no way to really communicate with each other. So they decided to do chat as a way to shorten the bridge so that you feel more connected with your audience and you're more likely to share more personal things and do more uh, input more in your story and essentially, again, get you more engaged. Next up, live. I don't even think many people use this thing. The only thing that was important about live was this notification. Basically knowing that there were people there at the same time as you. That is in a really, really powerful but subtle move that is overlooked frequently. I mean, the, the Beats 1 concept in, in, in Apple, or Apple Music, we'll talk about later, kind of uses this a little bit. But the idea that you know that you're not alone, that is an amazing shift. And it gets people really, really excited, and it makes you feel like you're there. Like, the, like you don't feel like you're alone. Like, you could be in Antarctica on Facebook, and you don't feel like you're alone. It's just not the emotional thing that you get. But, um, you know, this is them basically trying to mimic some of these things and bring forth some of that emotional um, need into engagement. So next up was Discover. So now we've basically got an entirely new content type and a bunch of audience and an audience that's closely communicating with their creators. So why don't we just make the creators, um, you know, a bunch of brands. Now, I think most people would look at this and go, oh, this is a step to monetization because we have sold Discover. Well, yes, but... They also brought a bunch of professional storytellers onto the app at the same time. And if you look at the engagement outside of Discover on length of story, length of individual videos and in story, and um, number of stories shared, it all went up. Because you saw other people doing it professionally, so you could copycat. Perfect. Next up was tap and hold. They got rid of it so that you could make longer stories and you didn't have to sit there with your damn thumb on the screen. Um, it's important. And then the last step was memories. Yet another thing that they got rid of in terms of ephemeral, um, the ephemerality of the app. 
Now, all of these things may seem like overall general iterations on this concept, and it seems, of course, very, very obvious because you know, we all get to look at it hindsight, but Snapchat went from doing a photo app that disappeared that a lot of people are using to sext each other to creating an entire generation of video editors making their own reality show every single day and broadcasting it to their friends. That is a remarkable achievement. The next way I think that we can look at um, like emerging or rotating on that axis of trust is by organizing principle. So, of course, you knew that I was going to talk about music at some point, so I can't, I can't wait any longer. So at Beats and at Apple, there's a couple different ways that we thought about you know, the sort of the organizing principle, and we'll get to them in a minute, but first, a little background. So when we decided to, to launch Beats, the initial idea was that, okay, well, music has always been the product. The recorded song has always been the product, right? So with the with basically with on demand and music becoming essentially devalued like music is now a service but since all music like the, having access to all the music in the world like as in a search bar i mean spotify has that rhapsody had that like what's differentiated about the experience so our bet was that uh curation was the service was that what we would do is and try to find some way to express curation to you in an app that would be subtle but clear uh, and you would see the value in not just the service of having all of the music, but you would see the value in our curation. This was the whole concept of editors. We had a bunch of other things in there. But the clearest way that we, I can show you um, an example of what we tried to do around curation. So moving from having everything to, uh, to trusting us that we would be able to take care of you was the onboarding flow from Beats Music, which is still in Apple. Um, so I use the Beats example because it looks better on a screen because it's not all white. But the, um, so, so basically, curation is a, one way to consider curation is a conversation between X and Y. So it could be you as an individual with a group of editors and experts. You as an individual with other users. You as an individual, like that's collaborative filtering. You as an individual with... Um, a radio personality, or, as a, or you actually as a group, the listeners with a radio personality, et cetera. So um, what we decided to do when we onboarded you is to basically have a conversation with you to let you know that this is the kind of thing we were going to do in the app. And so we asked you what kind of music you liked, and then we, we then took you through like a quick onboarding flow. But each of these things were um, not optimized for like efficiency of information design, efficiency in information design. It wasn't optimized for speed. You know, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't optimized for anything except for trying to communicate to you what to expect. It's like, tell me what you like. Tell me the genres of music you like. Cool. Okay, here's some artists. Which one of these do you like? Okay, cool. We're going to do some stuff right now, so hold tight. And then what we're going to do is then show you a bunch of artists and playlists. And I think our, there were some things that were messed up with this as, as they are with every single like, launch of anything recommendations oriented. But I got to say, like, the recommendations in Beats Music were pretty damn good. And they were well in advance of anything Spotify ever did or, or even Apple did, obviously. So I, th I really thought that they were, they had their troubles, but they were pretty damn good. They were better than anything else that was out there at the time. And the reason why is because we just asked for very simple information and we constructed a recommendation algorithm behind it that wasn't based on collaborative filtering, having a shitload of data or anything. What we said was, okay, if you're going to have a conversation between a person who likes music and a bunch of editors who are supposed to recommend stuff, what would you do? You'd have this basic conversation with them. The editors would then group a bunch of shit because they have it in their heads and then send it to you. So we just automated the heuristics that editors use to, um, to essentially to deliver music if you had a conversation with them. I always said that the best interface for this, for this should have been chat. You just ask somebody, I, I like this, and then they just send you a bunch of stuff. Um, so anyway, that's one way that we tried, to, we tried to sort of rotate. But I think the clearer example is the most recent release of Apple Music, which is the last thing I had a chance to work on when I was at Apple. So there's two things that conflated and things that we learned from like this idea of having a conversation as like the organizing principle for each of the elements of the, of the application to then 
what has happened with the the value of music and, and like the user behavior when you have everything? Like the concept of a library is pretty much, I mean, it's nice, but it's not necessary in the same form as it used to be because it's no longer an ownership mentality, it's an access mentality. So why is it exactly this, like that, why is it designed in that way? And I think that the most recent version of, of Apple Music shows you where like sort of the organizing principle of these like kind of very heavy music apps are going. So each of the four or each of the five tabs at the bottom of, of the, the, the most recent Apple Music, update it and try it out, please. That's my like my, my uh, former Apple employee uh, sales pitch. Um, I guess why I don't work there anymore. The, uh, the, there's basically five different things, right? So the library is the, uh, like the common organizing principle based on ownership. For you is a combined organizing principle based on recommendations and different entry points into your library based on context. Browse is like a music magazine in like the shortest, choppiest form possible. Um, and radio is a shared listening experience and search is, well, search. So. I'm just going to go through really quickly sort of some of the thinking um, and, and my own personal analysis of, what, of like what's going on in each of these things. Ooh, did I actually have, did I take a screenshot of the Beyonce album in my library? Anyway, um, <laughs> so, the, uh, so the library essentially is like classic organizing principle. You understand, you understand what it is. It's not, it's not that hard to understand, but essentially it's like, okay, let's simplify and, and let's simplify it to death. A bunch of entry points at the top and text and then recently added. Recently added, honestly, is the most used thing on the planet when it comes to libraries these days because it's just like, I just want to listen to a thing I just listened to. Um, so like the other thing that's interesting about libraries before I get to for you, when I get to libraries is that um, the... I think Apple made a mistake with this in this one. I think it needs to be longer recently added. But like once you get up to a few hundred artists, it might as well just be search. Like it doesn't really make any sense to have it anymore. It's just like it's just like special search. Like I don't know, search search the things that I said bookmark at some point. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, but it's still there. And so like I would say this is more the old school way. And I would say this is more the new school way. And so for you, started off as being this recommendation algorithm, which I told you before, which is this idea of taking editors and, and essentially um, uh, like just using their heuristics and displaying it on the screen to do all these recommendations. All that stuff is still there, but there's a few additional things that are different entry points into being able to traverse the corpus of 40 million songs. So first is my new music mix. Um, I have a, like a weeping story about Spotify Discover Weekly, which I'll tell you after, afterwards. But, the, uh, but essentially, it's a very similar thing to, um, to Discover Weekly. And then we have the other version, which is um, you know, the, the, uh, the My Favorites mix, which is essentially just like a, a, a playlist of things from your library with a couple different additional things in there. But I mean, it's pretty interesting. But I mean, I think you guys all understand what it is. So it's not like it wasn't anything drastically new. I think one of the things that are more interest, that's in more interesting about this, and I, I wish that I was still at Apple to see the engagement of how it's all working, but it's all the different ways that we're providing entry points, and we're changing them based on day. So your for you is changing day to day. And so as you can see, below it is recently played. So above it, it's recommendations. And then actually, this entirely is all my library in for you. So these are just new entry points. So the organizing principle is not about trying to get you into music that's recommended to you that's brand new. I'm not trying to like like pump the Roosevelt CD down your throat or the new Lady Gaga or MIA or whatever. I'm just, I'm just saying like, listen, you probably like this. Here's some new ways to explore your library, the things that you've bookmarked in the past, because guess what? You have no idea how to get to this shit unless you search for it. So I'm just going to remind you that it exists. So we do the same things as we, the same things as we did um, before when it came to Beats in terms of putting personality and curation into the playlist. I mean, everybody's pretty much doing this now with their own different flavor. But, I mean, we're still spotlighting artists. But notice, the other thing that's interesting about sort of the recommendations here, and I think it's key to the organizing principle, is that this isn't the case in everything, but in most cases, there's no endorsement. It's not because you like bleh. It's not like because, because you listen to rock. Who cares? Like, like I, I, the last thing I want to know is that a computer thinks I like this because I listen to rock. That's horrible. 
it like disconnects me so completely from the idea of having a good music listening experience to know that there's some like server farm in Iceland that's like com computing my tastes. It's horrible. Even if it's the case, we should get rid of it. It should feel like a human being actually gave us the damn music like it did in the past. And so, the, you know, the idea here is like, okay, like these are, these are just spotlights on artists that we, we know that you'll like or we think that you'll like. So cool. Next up is like new releases, duh. And then Connect um, is, you know, it's just yet another way for artists to be able to communicate back with their fans. But it largely ended up being a uh, more of a promotional device or like a Twitter light or something. It didn't actually end up being what I think it could be. So, all right, next up is Browse. I'm going to get through this pretty quickly. But, like, next up is Browse. Again, like, it's a really short way, uh, a really short and abbreviated form of kind of like a music magazine. So it's essentially, you know, quick highlights of what's going on in culture in your particular region. The uh, concept behind it, the organizing principle behind this is essentially how can we get you to a curated playlist as fast as possible. And that doesn't mean least number of steps. That means least, number of, least amount of cognitive load. So if you go back here, new music curated playlists, videos, top charts, and genres might not be the best way to organize this thing, but I bet you it's the way with least cognitive load on the user. Same thing with here. So curated playlists, yep, okay, cool. Like, I mean, curated playlists, what a weird title for a screen, but it's like pretty blatant. So like, this is what you're getting. This is the value proposition, right? Like, we're going to organize this tab based on curation. And, you know, and we're going to actually have curators and Playlists that are, you know, new music that are like, that's playlists that are just about new music. So again, this sort of like very bold, clear explanation is a way to like bring people around to the idea that there's, there, the, the music service that we've designed is essentially a bunch of entry points into a giant corpus of music that's very, very hard to manage. And then so this is an example of what a genre is like. This is different than Beats. In Beats, we had much more concept of like a human being editor, and here it's just a genre label. I'm not sure if I like it or not, but it doesn't matter. This is what it is. Um, and what's interesting about it is that um, it's just abundantly clear what you're going to get. And then again, artist playlists in the genre. So all of these entry points are basically like low cognitive load, highly simplified ways to explore and, and, and dive into a very complex catalog. Um, rather than trying to you know, conceptually change the library, it's more like, okay, let's just give a bunch of entry points and see what works. Radio is interesting because it's a shared experience um, across multiple um, across multiple countries, multiple people, and like that's exemplified mostly by Beats One. So the the idea, the organizing principle here is that okay, radio, like internet radio, especially Pandora, like you don't feel like you're with anybody, you just feel like you're alone. And like Spotify's radio, I never really felt like I'm hanging with people, although I haven't used it in a couple months, so maybe it's changed, but. Like, I never really feel that way, and that's cool. Like, sometimes I don't want to feel that way. But what I, do, what I do like about, like, the concept of Beats 1 that we tried to achieve was, okay, let's make it so that it feels like there's somebody else in the room listening with you. And it's not like there's 100 billion people listening to this every single day, so it's the, like, you know, it's the most, you know, it's the busiest room ever, and it's kind of hard to understand that you're there, but it's, like, it's very subtle. So, and then next is search. So again, the, the idea around, um, around music and what, what Apple did with the most recent release is essentially start down the path. Like if they, we were doing the Snapchat example, this is like the third visual I showed you. Start down the path of being able to take, take folks into this giant corpus of music in a way that's completely different than what their library is. Because I don't think that that like, to keep the library and to keep going is a, would be an iterative process. And this is the way that they're going to take people on the path of um, trusting them to not need to use it. So the last thing I want to talk to you about, and I'll be pretty, pretty quick, is, um, is business model. So like, how do you emerge on a business model? Um, so the, I'll stand over here for a minute. Um, get out of that sun, <laughs> that light over there. So the, the um, when you try to emerge on a business model, there's been a lot of like um, a lot of work done on this um, by these guys, uh, Al Ramadan and a couple other folks. They wrote this book called Play Bigger, but essentially it's all about um, category design. And so the idea is that like if you're really going to develop a new business or a new a new business that's like really really worth a shit ton of money or whatever, like you are you definitely need to consider at some point 
getting into a new category or establishing yourself as a category leader. Um, and so when you think about the music industry, this is what people think of as the category leaders. It's essentially the major labels. They have other arms to them, which I'll explain in a minute, but this is what you think of, right? It's worth about $12 billion currently. Everybody's like, ah, oh, the music industry's going to shit, da 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 Well, it's still a $12 billion industry, so it's not exactly small. And there's other, there's other corollary industries that are uh, worth uh, even more. So very basic about the music industry. Two ways to make money. Compositions, like the actual notes on the page, the words of the song, the, the music itself, and then masters, the recordings of the music. Essentially, the entire music industry has been based on those two elements for years. It is completely, it is ready to be disrupted. So it already has been to some degree. So first is the master recording. This is pretty obvious. We all know that there are albums. We all know that Napster destroyed everything and made everything free. We all know that iTunes came about and made everything 99 cents and easily. But the thing that was interesting about iTunes is that it, it actually broke the album. Everyone thought in terms of an album until iTunes came out. And then they saw, started to think in terms of songs. Pandora came along and basically said, okay, now that we're thinking in terms of songs, we can use a song as a seed um, for a radio station. So a more lean back experience rather than having to traverse iTunes to pick what you want. So it was like the first sort of automated service, right? So there's... You know, it's a kind of a, a different way of thinking of the experience. But remember, so iTunes essentially was, we're going to save the music industry by making everything 99 cents and easy to buy on convenience. So that was their rotation. Pandora is like in parallel saying, well, it can be free and ad supported, but radio needs to be rotated by basically making it easy for people to pick the kind of radio they want to listen to because American radio kind of sucks. Um, sorry if anybody works in radio. Um, but... It's, it's, real, it's a tough business. So then YouTube smashed the idea of, um, of the album as, totally because they, it put into practice the easiest sharing capability on the planet. It still works. If you want to share a song with somebody, you're going to use anything but YouTube? Like Spotify kind of works. If your friends have Spotify, I'm in this group. I'm in this private group where we share music back and forth. Every time I post something from Apple Music, I'm like, should I put the Spotify link? And is it on SoundCloud? And I'm like, I can't believe this. I've been working in the damn music industry for 10 years, and I still haven't figured this damn problem out. YouTube figured it out. Um, and they basically made it so that everyone could, could easily share. That's the biggest thing that YouTube did. You could upload and you could share basics. But you couldn't trust, like there was no trust that the user had that what you would put out could be listened to because it was so walled off. So then Spotify came along and added freemium and basically smashed the, ad smashed the business model again. But they didn't smash it because they added $9.99 a month. They smashed it because they changed the psychology from paying for music to paying for the removal of ads. And that's where Beats came in. We thought that the ad support, we agreed with Lucian, it's one of the very rare times that I agree with the guys from Universal, but the, like, we agreed that essentially ad support is not a good, not a good uh, way to fund the ecosystem in the future. Maybe it needs to be a part of it, but I don't, I don't think it's the way to create, make a new creator economy. So we thought creation could be a service and we wouldn't put a free tier in. I talked a little bit about that before. And... Then Apple came along and basically bought us, and then we, we continued the path with them. But like Apple's path has been of recent more about exclusives and windowing, like the Frank Ocean thing, which is now on Spotify. And um, you know, Title's doing it as well with um, some of the stuff with uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z. And I don't know, doesn't this seem wrong? Because like, the value of the recorded song is essentially the value of an ad at this point. Like, like all of the psychology has basically changed it to be the case. I weep internally that that's the case as a music lover, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to deny reality. Because basically what people are paying for is the ability to listen to music without commercials. And so, okay. Why are we basing the business model of artists and creators of a major cultural institution on the value of the recorded song still? Because the value isn't there. Because the value comes from, oh, data? Uh, I don't know. 
Do you think that if you were an artist and you saw this, you'd be like, damn, can't wait to come back to Spotify fan, fan insights. Their managers love it. But like, is that going to be the way that artists are going to be inspired to continue to create and make money? Sure. Once they're established, they're going to use this stuff. Um, and it's like, it totally can work. And this is fantastic. And it's a step that we need to take in, in the next generation. And like, Again, I'm not against $9.99 a month music or, or, or Spotify's payments or Apple's payments or any of that stuff. I think it's all good. But I don't think this is like, this is an iterative step, not the next step for the industry because, yeah, nope. Because I think that the next step for this, for, for the music industry, is all around audience. And like, oh God, I'm going to drop the dreaded, if anybody's ever in the music industry, you ever, you've heard the words direct to fan and you're going to want to like run out of the room. But like, I'm not talking about selling merch to people on the internet, but I do think that like, there is something that will emerge that basically handles the idea of managing an artist's audience. I was talking to an artist a few months ago, and she remarked that she had changed managers. And this is like a fairly well-established major artist. She had changed managers, and she lost her email list. And I was like, what do you mean you lost your email list? She's like, oh no, you change your manager, you lose your, you lose your audience. I go, what? I was like, that's your audience. And I'm like, no, well, he's contracted. And I'm like, what? Fucked up. Like, there's, you should definitely, like, that's not, that's not how it should be. Like, the, how it should be is that artists should be able to interact with their audience in three inflection points, content, community, and commerce. And they should be able to monetize based on the size and the quality of their audience. Like, social media has shown us that we can essentially build audiences. Um, we can build big audiences but I think the next thing is going to be about building right audiences, and that will actually start to solve the creator economy problem that everybody's trying to solve with dashboards and data. And maybe people are working on it. Hopefully Spotify is working on it, or Apple. The next thing is a composition, super quick. Now, uh, when you're a songwriter, you register with one of these three organizations, and they pay you whenever the hell they feel like it. And then recently, there was, somebody, there was an organization from Europe called Cobalt. It's been around for almost 11 years, and it took a long time for them to develop trust. And what they did is they essentially um, decided that there's only two things they needed to change. They changed a bunch of different stuff. The first thing is we will give you accurate accounting and data to your, uh, like for your payments. So prior to this, you would just get a check in the mail from ASCAP that just said $12. Cool. For what? Like, I have no clue. They, like, your song could have been used in a Honda commercial and you've been paid $12 for it and you have no idea that it was used. But now, they're actually showing accounting. It's, you know, it doesn't seem like it's rocket science, but, you know, doing that is getting them a lot, of, uh, a lot of credibility. And the second thing is rights. They transferred the rights of the song compositions away from needing to own them to putting them under exclusive license that the artist can remove. That is revolutionary. It's super subtle. Nobody talks about this. There's no like Google Trends topic on like the, the song composition rights of artists being transferred back from like the major labels publishing houses to Cobalt or through Cobalt back to the artist. No, it's too, it's too complex. But that is something. Like the idea that they are going to build an entire business on services for the artist around monetization of their catalog that, is based, that, is, that basically says you can cancel at any time, artists. Huge shift. And it's just starting to ripple now. And like even in the industry, I don't think they know what's going to happen with it yet. But it basically, they're going to be the first to essentially change songwriting from being something where you have to give up the rights to your music to one where you own it and you've got to earn the right to collect from me. It's a big difference. So quick recap. So okay, like all these, a couple examples, a couple ideas. So if I wanted to do this, I wanted to grow my thing or what I'm working on, what, what, is, what are the ways that I would do it? So one is just very, very succinctly develop some values, develop your true north. The second is to design the path, go from awareness to referral. So this is like when somebody finds out about the thing you're, you're doing, all the way to when somebody is um, making an emotional decision about it. And so you have to design that whole experience. That's that dream I talked about in the beginning. And then the last thing is that at each stage, when you put something out in front of somebody, you want to evaluate emotively what is happening with your audience. Yes, evaluate quantitatively, but evaluate emotively as well. 
And the way that you do that is by having a conversation with the people that you're evaluating it with around the trust dynamic that you feel is in your experience, whether it's your art installation or your product or your design or whatever. And that is a few basic questions. What are we doing? What do we feel? What connection are we creating? What personality do we feel? And then my favorite question, because it's, a, it's, a, it's gotta be one or the other, is are we building or breaking trust with our audience in this experience? And then finally, what can we do different? And I think that, you know, hopefully I've been able to, you know, walk through some thinking in the way that I think about trying to build things that aren't just incrementally better, but are revolutionarily different. So thank you so much.